Bahia de Soledad, the Bay of Solitude. One of the many shallow bays and lagoons which crenellate the western coast of Mexico's Baja California. For nearly 40 million years, these secret sanctuaries have been peacefully shared by the pterodactyl-like pelicans and huge terrestrial mammals who long ago in the evolutionary drama re-entered the undersea's world, the desert whales. December 22nd. We have been tracking and filming pods of California gray whales on the final leg of their southerly migration. We are especially fascinated by the pregnant females. In labor, they roll over, presenting their underbellies upward. This is to extrude their newborn toward the surface for their first breath of life-giving air. nervous tons of pregnant gray whale slaps down one of Calypso's buzzing chase boats. It is a close call. With enormous vertical sweeps of their 12-foot wide tail flukes, the 50-foot grays can generate enough power to attain speeds up to 10 knots. With a single angry wallop, wounded whales have been known to use their tail flukes to smash sturdy 20-foot whaling boats into kindling wood. And in the old cemeteries of American seaports, many a tombstone bears the laconic inscription, killed while whaling. Some, no doubt, by the wily and agile gray. January 4th. We have called on a reconnaissance plane to assist us in locating the scattered pods of migrating gray whales with whom we lose contact at night. Generally, in the daylight, they remain close to the surface on their steady migration southward. The southerly migration of the gray whales begins in the Arctic Ocean and the Bering Sea. There in shallow bays, the grays feed and wean their young during a summer orgy of feeding on a biological explosion of plankton and crustaceans. 
Then, with an eight-month reserve of oily blubber, these huge natural tankers embark upon a journey unsurpassed by any other mammal in the natural world. 5,000 miles to their ancestral breeding grounds in the desert lagoons of Baja, California, the destination of the Calypso. My son, Philippe Cousteau, will film our gray whale expedition. Dr. Ted Walker, an eminent scientist with the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, will assist us in our life study of the gray whale. The future of the gray whale is in grave peril. Perhaps by learning more about the greys, we can help save him from extinction. Philippe Cousteau and Dr. Walker will work from the Polaris III during much of the expedition. A shallow draft ship attached to the Calypso operation, the Polaris III will be used largely to follow the whales into their extremely shallow breeding lagoons. Tagging and inshore tracking operations will also take place from the Polaris during the last stages of migration. Harmless barbs are attached to the tagging streamers. Dr. Walker hopes by tagging some of the greys to determine if the whales remain in one breeding area or wander throughout the 450 miles of the Baja breeding grounds. Refusing to be deterred from their split-second timetable, the powerful greys take evasive action and pick up speed. Next in the tracking operation, an attempt will be made to attach a luminous tracking buoy to a pod leader. Dr. Walker seeks to discover if the greys scatter and sleep at night, or if the migration continues uninterrupted. Target gray sweeps sharply around the zodiac, following the boy line in its propeller. A lookout spots the spout of another pod leader, and a second attempt is made to secure the tracking boy. The second attempt fares no better than the first and the determined gray leader plows ahead toward his destination. The harmless dart is returned to Polaris for examination. Fantastically stiff. There and here and here. Undaunted, Canaway takes his lunch on the run. Still another large whale leader has been spotted nearby. Apparently, word has got around among the acoustically oriented grays that our intentions are suspect. The elusive gray dives. Canaway throttles back and waits. Undisturbed, migrating grays rarely remain under for more than four minutes at a time. Canaway times his approach perfectly with the surfacing gray. Driven by an undeniable instinct and unperturbed by the nominal drag of the tracking boy, 
the target whale implacably maintains his homeward bound course. He's headed south. The Zodiac remains alongside the tracking buoy to act as a pace boat for the Polaris to follow. This is the speed that I've tracked them with all day long, three knots. A migrating gray going home must maintain a relentless day in and day out pace for nearly three months before he can join with his own kind to ensure the perpetuation of the species. Many elements of the California gray whales seem to prefer a migration course which roughly follows the shallow underwater contours paralleling the coastline. Dr. Walker has the rare scientific opportunity to personally confirm that at least one gray whale, with only a slight slowing down in speed, migrates throughout the night. By dawn, the Polaris has tracked the indomitable gray for an overall time of 18 hours. Now only a few miles ahead, the breeding waters of one of the largest remaining mammals on Earth. Dr. Walker points out the prime breeding lagoons and suggests a long-range plan to film the activities of the greys to Captain Cousteau, who has come aboard the Polaris. Well made, that it's heading into the waters, in which we'll have our best luck photographically, running all the way down here to Magdalena Bay. Within hours, the grey is on the last lap of his extraordinary journey, dead ahead home. One of the many tidal lagoons etched into the dunes of the plain of Magdalena. And then, for what might only be interpreted as an expression of sheer animal exuberance, the gray lobtails. A mighty signal to any and all thereabouts that he has arrived. The tracking boy lies dead in the water. But the gray is free, as he should be. We shall observe that keep inviolate this ancient sanctuary, the home of one of the most majestic creatures ever to have evolved since life began, the desert whale. January 27th. Today, Philippe will go aloft with Calypso's observation balloon to search out procreation areas of the gray whales. With luck, he will locate some of the greys just outside of the murky inner lagoons in clear water. We will then attempt to observe and film an act of nature rarely, if ever, seen by man before, the mating of the desert whales. Dr. Walker believes the greys continue to breed in the lagoons for several reasons. The shallow waters are temperate and safe harbors for the young. And the constant tidal upswellings of sea nutrients gives rise to a veritable plasma of life on which the whales feed. From his aerial platform, Philippe Cousteau spots a male grey aggressively courting an apparently willing female. A Calypso cameraman moves quickly to record on film the unique mating drama of the underwater titans. As our underwater cameraman silently approaches the now mating greys, the female detects his alien presence. She breaks away from the male and dives. The male follows. Together, they move off to a deeper privacy. And then a stroke of incredible luck. A trio of gray whales, two males and a female, in excited unmindfulness surface within yards of the Zodiac. A cameraman slips over the side without a sound. He then records what no man has ever seen before, the monumental overture of conception between two leviathans of the deep, 
while in the presence of a younger but no less ardent suitor. Awaiting Philip's descent, I recall the naming of the greys, the desert whales. A startled 19th century whaling captain was the first to spot among the distant heat waves of the Baja Desert, rising whale spouts. By pure chance, he had discovered the secret breeding lagoons of the California greys. But today, there are no whalers in these totally protected Mexican waters. Only divers and scientists on peaceful missions. On February 2nd, Philippe Cousteau and Dr. Walker set out to film and observe the interaction between the mother greys and their young. Mothers and their newborn calves normally lead a solitary existence. Therefore, the mothers must be approached with great caution. If alarmed, they can be extremely dangerous and have been known to savagely attack small fishing crafts which unwittingly drifted between the mother and her calf. Little hope is held out for the success of the underwater filming of the mother and babies. Continuous bottom feeding has so added to the cloudiness of the 30 to 40 feet plankton haze shallows that visibility has been reduced to nearly zero. For complete silence, the divers work without air tanks. Absolute stealth is necessary to get within camera range of the mothers and babies. It is an impossible effort. We believe the mother greys detect the divers' proximity by a natural echo-ranging capability. When the divers come too close, the mother whales calmly move off with their young in tow. After hundreds of attempts to outsmart the mother whales, even my best men are discouraged. Didn't see a thing. Pregnant greys apparently get little, if any, sleep on their three-month southerly migration. They make up for this lack after the birth of their young. For an hour or more at a time, they will lie motionless at the surface of the lagoon, their deep sleep only modulated by their rhythmic breathing. At these times, they can be silently approached within a few feet by a small boat. Restless and always hungry baby greys, like the newborn of many species, do not seem to appreciate these lapses in motherly attention. Too dependent to range of fire, the babies idle away their time by constantly prodding at the slumbering mothers, as if they wanted to awaken them, or perhaps to reassure themselves that the quiet but familiar hulk is truly home. Baby whales are born tail first, so that the baby can immediately rise to the surface to breathe. A good swimmer at birth, the baby stays close by his mother's side until he has been weaned. To a baby whale, food and safety are a large body his mother, or at times, any other large object, like a ship's hull. Captain Cousteau has decided to improve the opportunities for observing and filming Mother Grey's feeding their young by having the auxiliary ship Polaris move to a more heavily populated nursery lagoon to the north. Once there, with cameras at the ready, the Polaris will position itself to drift silently with the prevailing breeze toward nursing mothers. 
The nursing of a baby gray whale begins when the mother whale rolls on her side with one of her pectoral flukes raised vertically in the air. This is the mother's way of presenting her milk paps to her baby. In this position, the calf can take the pap into its mouth while maintaining itself in a normal surface breathing position. When a mother gray has finished feeding large quantities of milk to her calf, she quickly turns into the prevailing tide. Without engine power, the Polaris is unsteerable. The calf moves to snuggle up to the Polaris hull, mistaking it for his mother's body. At that point, the mother makes a sudden about face to retrieve her baby and hurls him away from the alien hulk. Following the baby Gray's encounter with Polaris, I could not help but reflect on earlier times, when such a passing incident would have ended in a radically different way. Short-sighted greed led to such scenes of uncontrolled commercial butchering, which started in 1857. By 1937, there remained no more than a few dozen of desert whales. It was only then that the greys came under official protection, but with a reservation that should the species recover, the whaler could once again harvest the greys, but this time on a highly limited basis. Perhaps there can be another kind of life between man and a great sea mammal, for to touch life is to know of it, and to know of life is to love it. But there is only one way to touch, to know, to truly love a 35-ton whale. At least once in your life, you must ride with him in the wide open sea. Tonight, our divers have been working the clear waters outside the lagoons. They are catching some of the pelagic crabs on which the gray whales feed when at sea. At times, the crabs constitute the bulk of the gray whale diet. During the day, they gorge on the crabs near the bottom. At night, the crabs feed or spawn near the surface. Then the whale consumes prodigious numbers of this tiny creature, one ten millionth his weight. At what depth do the, the whales eat them? Well, they probably take them all the way to the bottom. Uh, we really don't have any definitive depth uh, measurements for the gray, but uh, judging from their distribution, they certainly don't dive much Because the grays live in a variety of sea environments, their diets and methods of acquiring food must also vary. Hence, inside the lagoons, they spy hop. Once thought to be a way of looking around topside, the greys actually scoop from the bottom long furrows of silt containing tiny invertebrates. Then, literally standing on their tails, the greys use gravity to force the food down to their gullets. Excess water and debris is compressed out through their baleen filters. This unique gravity feeding technique is best observed in detail by stop action photography.
constantly patrolling pelicans have helped us locate gray whales when they were feeding on fish. Therefore, when Serge Foulon spots a pelican who seems to be in distress, he sets out on a mission of mercy. But poor Serge, even a pelican can take unforgiving exception to the best of intentions. Serge's sore head, where the outraged pelican has severely wrapped him, is first evidence of this lesson in life. On board Calypso, the pelican gladly accepts the attentions it receives from all of the crew members, with the exception of one, Serge. <laughs> Even in the wild, gratitude is not always the reward of good deeds. On February 22nd, Dr. Walker and radio engineer Legario set out to obtain hydrophone recordings of the communication and echo-ranging signals transmitted by the Greys. It takes perseverance and skill to pick up the grinding creaks and deep snapping vocalizations of the Greys. With an instinct born of experience, the Greys will maintain a form of radio silence if disturbed or threatened. Sound. Yeah, well, Those mother and calf are coming by here now, and you can clearly hear the echo ranging as they come up on us. Yes. Sound communications between the mother and baby greys is vital in the turbid lagoons. With visual contact impossible, separation would mean death to the dependent baby. Get the mother and a baby and the, they're communicating, and uh, the mother is echo-ranging as she goes up the lagoon. She's completely dark. The primitive greys often seem to communicate with more facility than that sophisticated species, Homo sapiens. In the afternoon, tea is sometimes... Sometimes. 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 Served. No, served. 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 <laughs> served. 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 Yeah. At the office. Many people live out of town in the suburbs. 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 Vegetables. No, vegetables. 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 No, vegetables. Vegetables. No, <laughs> vegetables. <laughs> vegetables. <laughs> February 24th, Captain Cousteau takes to the air for a final survey of the desert lagoons. The time is near for the greys to begin their northerly migration. So Cousteau fans out the Polaris and the crew of Calypso to take an estimated census of the desert whales. Before the whalers decimated their numbers, there were about 20,000 grey whales living off the California coast. It took more than four decades of a protection for the recovery of the California herd. 
The Eastern Pacific gray population is estimated at 10 to 15,000. Cousteau has also asked the plane's pilot and the census parties to keep an eye out for mother and baby greys, who may have isolated themselves in extremely shallow areas. The inexperienced calves have been known to get fatally stranded on sandbars when the outrushing tides suddenly moved out from under them. At birth, an average baby gray whale is 12 feet long and weighs about one ton. Three months later, ready for the first long haul to the high latitudes of the Arctic Ocean, a calf may have grown to 19 feet and weigh up to 4,000 pounds. The death rate among very young gray whales is high. Disease and natural enemies take their toll. But life expectancy for adults is almost half a century. The largest cause of infant mortality among the greys is attributable to a natural characteristic common to most wild mammals. If a baby gray at birth is abnormal in any way, the mother will reject it and it will be returned to the continuum of life in nature's own way. But today there is a new unnatural threat to the lives of the desert whales. It is silent, insidious, and lethal. The killer, pollution. Worry that I think we have to think about in preserving the gray whales, really uh, eliminating any extra pollution which would come about from excessive use of the lagoon by man. As it is now, the lagoon is used only by occasional fishermen and is still pretty much in its pristine wild state. Well, you think that uh, pollution, if it developed here as it developed in, in southern California, for yeah. example, could uh, wipe out the gray whales. It could certainly deprive it of a tremendous amount of its winter feeding ground. And uh, since this is the sanctuary for the mother and baby, and since the species is a relic species, a species which by specialization has a rather limited habitat available, uh, there are only three or four lagoons in which it uh, winters. I think there is a very real possibility of uh, certainly reducing the species to near extinction. Uh, it's something I hope that won't happen. On February 28th, the reconnaissance plane reports the sighting of what appears to be a baby whale stranded on a sandbar near the entrance to the lagoon. Dr. Walker and Philippe Cousteau investigate. Based on the number of the wounds caused by the carnivorous gulls and sandpipers, Dr. Walker believes the baby gray probably became stranded sometime around midnight. He's alive. The faint but unmistakable signs of life in the baby gray sends Philippe Cousteau rushing for help from Calypso. Calypso, Calypso, the baby baleine is toujours vivant. Envoyez du monde et des cordes et un filet, vite. Out of water, a beached whale rapidly overheats, causing dehydration. He may also suffer sunburn. Seriously weakened, he could easily drown with the next high tide. The baby gray responds favorably to the cooling effects of the 60 degree water. Concerned but undismayed with the unprecedented situation, the Calypso rescue team immediately begins to gently negotiate the 3,000 pound baby gray into a supporting net. The objective, to maneuver the baby into the water where his natural positive buoyancy will cause him to become nearly weightless and easier to handle. The hopes of Dr. Walker and the men for reviving the baby gray are heightened by the fact that since morning, the day has been overcast. Perhaps the young whale has not dehydrated to the point of no return. They hurry. Okay, les gars, tout The 
effort of moving the baby gray is enormous, but time is critical and the rescue team presses on. Once afloat in deeper water, the baby gray is moved quickly toward the anchored launch. There, he will be firmly secured and then transported slowly to the waiting calypso. As the launch approaches calypso, Dr. Walker speculates on why the baby gray may have become stranded. Confused by the swift incoming tide, he may have been carried into waters too shallow for the mother to follow. Then, when the tide receded, the mother and the beached baby were no longer able to communicate. The mother then moved off into the vast lagoon on a wide search for her lost baby. In spite of the risk of sharks, Captain Cousteau decides that the baby gray whale should remain secured as he is to the launch throughout the night. I hoped that his mother, perhaps looking for him somewhere out there in the lagoon, might hear his desperate cries and return to her baby. Unfortunately, the mother of the baby gray whale did not appear during the night. It is now imperative that we attend to the baby the best we can. He is badly emaciated and needs attention to his wounds. Dr. Walker, improvising from ship's stores, prepares a substitute for the high-protein milk of the baby's mother. Dr. Walker believes that there is a fair to good chance the baby gray can be saved if he will accept the unfamiliar nourishment. Normally, a young whale requires a minimum of two or three feedings every 24 hours. At best, Calypso can serve as a first aid station. But if the orphaned whale survives, I have agreed with Dr. Walker to take him with us to a marine park. There he can receive more extensive care. For the first time in Dr. Walker's 23 years of study and observation of marine life, he is about to take the first step in becoming a foster parent to a baby desert whale. A galley funnel and a length of rubber hose is at best a poor imitation of a mother whale, but there is no alternative. Dr. Walker and the crew of Calypso can only hope that the hungry baby gray will adapt to the idea that necessity is the mother of invention. The jerry-rigged nursing apparatus is partially successful, but there is no way of determining how much nourishment the hungry baby has actually ingested. Dr. Walker decides to take a more practical step, for although squid is not known to be a normal part of the gray whale diet, it is high in protein content. And if the baby is to live, it must eat, even if it means feeding him by hand.
The strongest bond between man and sea mammals is food. Our baby whale proves to be no exception to this rule. He hangs on to his benefactor's hand for dear life. Philippe Cousteau inspects a special sea harness, which Maurice is rushing to completion. It will be used to provide the baby Gray with more freedom while he recuperates. In the meantime, the baby Gray is gently hoisted to the afterdeck of Calypso. There he will be carefully examined by Dr. Walker and his wounds treated against infection. The heart of a whale is so effectively insulated by fatty tissues that the stethoscope from our ship's pharmacy proves of little value to Dr. Walker. Next, Dr. Walker examines the wounds of the baby gray to determine an effective medication. Many lacerations have been embroidered by shorebirds along the sensitive lips shielding the glistening baleen strainers. Then, by observing the whale's nostrils, or a blowhole, Dr. Walker determines his respiratory rate. Finally, an antibiotic mixed with a water repellent base is applied to the baby gray's more serious wounds. All deliberate speed is now necessary. Out of water, a whale's own weight pressing down on his internal organs for an excessive time can be damaging. As the baby whale entered the water, I wondered how effective our administrations would be. While he appeared somewhat revitalized, I could see that he was having difficulty maintaining his equilibrium against even the slight flow of the tide. As we watched our young friend reach for life in his own way, I knew that we had done all we could for him. Now, as our long night's vigil was about to begin, we could only trust in nature for whatever would come tomorrow. Shortly before 3 a.m., the shark watch standing shotgun over the baby gray is changed. Up to this moment, all has been well. At three o'clock, I was awake by canoe, and I went on the quarter deck to see the baby whale, and I was surprised to see he was breathing with some difficulty. He was on his back, trying to survive. I awaked Ted Walker, and we saw that there was nothing to do. After some minutes, the baby whale stopped breathing. Yes. There was nothing else we could do. I don't think so. It was a hopeless situation.
Only the pelicans came, flying by in ancient salute. On the afternoon of March 2nd, for the first time in the long journey of Calypso, we bid an old goodbye to a very young friend. Time has come. The migration north begins. The old greys who know the way move out first, and the great herd follows. Destination, the Arctic Ocean, 5,000 miles beyond the horizon. The desert whales are on their way. Even the very young, the lucky ones who made it, charge ahead with a lively pace in this unmatched journey of the undersea's world. Desert whales are gone. But they will be back. And here they will begin their great life's adventure for all the years to come. If man will always keep this sanctuary the way it was when he first named it the Bay of Solitude. <laughs> 